Hi, everybody. Uh, this is Daniela Caruso. I am uh, the director of the Center for the Study of Europe, and we are here for a workshop that will be conducted by uh, Professor Kaya Schilde. Professor Kaya Schilde is an associate professor here at Boston University and at the Pardee School of Global Studies. We are delighted to have her here today. Her specialty is uh, trans transatlantic security and the political economy of security. Please, Kaya, welcome. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much, Professor Caruso. So I'm going to uh, uh, introduce everyone else then. Um, so on behalf of the Center for the Study of Europe and um, the Forced Migration Human Trafficking Initiative, we're excited to have Nicholas Masinski here today to talk about his book project on UN Global Compacts, Governing Migrants and Refugees. Um, this uh, event um, would have been, uh, you know, we would have had wonderful food and event, but um, if we had it in person, but uh, since we're not having it in person, we will just pretend we're doing it and have our own, our own things. But it is sponsored by the Center for the Study of Europe, Professor Caruso, and also Elizabeth Amrian, the assistant director, has been coordinating this. And then also the Force Group Migration Human Trafficking Initiative is myself and Professor Nura Lori, who's also in attendance. Um, she and I will be co-moderating the event um, and the discussion afterwards. So let me briefly introduce Nick. Um, Nick Masinski um, is our visiting researcher here at the Center for the Study of Europe. He's also simultaneously an ISA James Rosenau postdoctoral fellow. He is, if I do say so myself, a rising star in the academic field of migration studies. Um, this current research that he'll be presenting part of today is on international cooperation over migration management, um, specifically looking at international organizations such as the EU and UN, um, but globally, um, uh, international organizations and the kind of agreements they, they try to craft around migration management. Um, specifically, what he'll be presenting on today is agreements set by IOs called Global Compacts and asking why they emerged, what their effects are, and whether they actually imp improve the lives of refugees and migrants or not. His other pathbreaking work that I've read is um, really interesting about how refugee policy can be used by states as foreign policy, as tools of manipulation and control. Um, he also researches local dynamics of peace building and international development. He has conducted field work in a long list of places across Europe, Asia, India, um, and the US. And we're joining us today, we have the pleasure and the benefit of having Susan Akram, a clinical professor of law. Um, and she is, as Nura Lori said, a BU institution. And I could just leave it there. But she is an internationally renowned scholar of international law who's published widely on refugee asylum international law issues, um, uh, human rights and human rights law. Um, she's a clinical professor of law at Boston University, and she directs the BU Laws International Human Rights Clinic, supervising students in areas of international advocacy in domestic, international, region, regional, and UN forums. So we are delighted to have these rising and eminent scholars here in a conversation about this relevant and timely work. So Nick, would you like to start? Welcome. Yeah. Thank you very much, and thank you for hosting me. I really appreciate everyone's participation and for the Center of the Study of Europe. Um, it's been really lovely being here the last year, even though part of it has been distance. Um, BU is a great community and has been really supportive. Um, so I just wanted to give a little background on this project and help uh, you understand where I'm coming from, and then I can jump into the main argument and structure. Okay, so. Um, I came to this project because I previously worked at a refugee charity in London for three to four years. Um, I went to grad school in New York City to study the UN and migration. And in 2016, I was conducting field work in Greece and Italy when thousands of people were arriving by boats each week. The UN launched the New York Declaration in the middle of my field work. And so I spoke to many UN officials, practitioners, uh, government officials about the declaration and the compact. So I developed this project because I saw some gaps in the literature. First, many of the things research has been produced on the compacts is from the UN. So it's not as critical as I think we as scholars want. Um, there's also a lot published by NGOs, which is very critical, <laughs> but doesn't necessarily have the context of history or the political constraints. And finally, there's a lack of understanding of what 
um, is actually in the compacts and what they actually say. And so much of this book project was to analyze the content and contributions of the compacts. So um, this book uh, introduces briefly the most important concepts when studying global migration governance and places them within uh, the historical context, including the uh, New York Declaration for Refugees and Migrants. For example, in one chapter, I explore the negotiation strategies and um, the negotiation positions of different states, the UN agencies and civil society groups, and the backlash from um, many governments, uh, specifically in Europe. I don't have a lot of time to go into that today, but I will say that the book has a lot on that, so I uh, will refer you to that or in the questions and answer in the, in the, later on. I then turn to the actual substance of the two compacts and show their contributions to global governance and what's missing, because they're, they're not quite um, everything that we might have wanted. My main argument is that the global compacts are the result of three shifts in global politics from treaties to compacts, from rights to aid, and from Cold War politics to nationalism. So states have shifted from relying on treaties, hard law, to preferring soft law, things like declarations and compacts, in part because these are perceived as being less binding than treaties, and they're more flexible. The second shift from uh, rights to aid, you see, uh, states started off defining rights for refugees and migrants, and now they're shifting to rallying voluntary support for more humanitarian aid. UNHCR, the supervisory uh, body of 1951 Refugee Convention, has become the most successful fundraiser within the UN system, often remaining silent though, on some of the most egregious human rights violations from its biggest funders, the EU and the US. Finally, the last shift, the compact packs are part of a wider shift uh, from the politics of the Cold War, in which the US and the Soviet Union saw refugees as important tools in their proxy wars, sort of what uh, Kaya mentioned earlier is my previous research. It's now shifted to the politics of nationalism, in which governments are openly embracing xenophobic rhetoric and attacking human rights treaties. Consequently, the compacts only address one of the five challenges of global migration governance, that is uh, coordination, and they ignore the other challenges. And I'll describe many of the challenges in, uh, in the next bit. So the outline for the talk today, I just told you our argument. I'll give you a little bit of background. Uh, we'll go into the challenges of global migration governance, a bit about the negotiations, because I think that is really interesting. And then I'll focus most of my talk on the global compact on refugees, and the Global Compact for, ref, uh, for Migration, and then end with a conclusion. So what are we talking about when I say uh, global migration governance? This is defined as the international laws, norms, principles, and rules that govern migration policies, how states decide their migration uh, policies. It's made up of treaties, compacts, court decisions, norms, and principles, and the rules of how institutions make their decisions. Now, these rules uh, and institutions influence state behavior around migrants and refugees. And they're not necessarily binding. Some are, treaties often are legally binding, um, and others uh, are soft law, less binding. Uh, and only states that sign on to these treaties or agreements are bound by them, uh, except for, of course, customary and other types of international law. Now, they're not necessarily longstanding uh, norms either. Some may be introduced and be sort of growing and emerging. We will identify later on in the talk some of the emerging norms that we're looking for. And not necessarily all states are participating. Now, that's sort of a contradiction, global migration governance without everyone, but um, not all of these institutions include all the states. So just a little bit more background on the sort of idea of global migration governance. Within it, a lot of scholars point to two different regimes, the refugee regime and the migration regime, regime. The refugee regime would be anchored in the 1951 Refugee Convention and the 1967 Protocol. Um, it has concepts like the first country of asylum, spontaneous arrival of asylum, principle of non Um Other things that are part of the regime are durable solutions. Uh, UNHCR is a norm entrepreneur here who piloted and actually executes resettlement, 
repatriation and local integration as the long-term solutions to refugee situations. Now, others have claimed that there is no international migration regime, but I characterize it as, in the book, as less developed. There are treaties and norms, but less um, states have signed on to the binding treaties, and not as many policy areas have been covered by treaties. So you'll see a few ILO conventions, but few of these are, um, most of them are, are not signed by many states. The most recent one, the 1990 Migrant Workers Convention, was only signed by 55 states. However, you could say these norms are emerging and growing, and they still have impact on how states, even those who have not signed the treaties, uh, how they behave. Other ideas that are part of migration regime are ideas like decent conditions for migrant workers, uh, secure travel documents, you know, the little microchip in your passport, and prohibition against uh, human trafficking and migrant smuggling. Now, uh, I consider migration, global migration governance, all of these issues combined, and um, I'll tell you why in just a minute. Um, but the question is why consider both refugee and migration regimes together as part of global migration governance? Well, the UN actually did not. They created two separate compacts for this, in part to silo the rights of migrants and refugees separately. But um, today I'll highlight a little bit more about that. I analyze refugee and migration regimes as subsets of the global migration governance in order to compare the two approaches and see the similarities and differences and see what's left out, who's left out of both of the treaties, right? of both of the compacts, I'm sorry. While refugees uh, have different rights, there are a lot of overlaps with vulnerable migrants. Importantly, no regime covers all forms of migration, only regimes for particular policy areas. So it's all of these different bits combined that form overall global migration governance. Now, the main challenges to global migration governance are many, but I've highlighted five here. The first is lack of capacity. Most states and international organizations don't have standing capacity to respond to a large influx or large movement of people. Emergency responses must mobilize financial and human resources like border and um, border guards, asylum officers, doctors, humanitarian workers, and tents, food and water supplies. This is just not standing around for it. So global migration governance helps create that capacity and, um, and fund it. But there's a, a lot of lack of it so far. Um, there's a lack of responsibility sharing. There is no formula for who will host and who will pay for refugees. And the word responsibility uh, sharing is controversial in and of itself. Third, the lack of access to protection. Now, many states in the global north have very rigorous asylum systems, but refugees who are produced and often um, come from the global south can't actually get to the global north, in part because of carrier sanctions created by the global north. So there's a lack of access to that protection. The fourth area is lack of citizenship, meaning um, migrants and refugees are often relegated to a second class status in which discrimination between citizenships, citizens and non-citizens is legal. Uh, also, migrants and asylum seekers fall through the gaps of, a, of social services that are only accessible to citizens um, in addition to other legal protections. And the last area or challenge is the lack of coordination. And there are a plethora of actors and stakeholders in part because of the sort of fractured uh, global regime that we have. Um, and it leads to an incoherent, uh, duplicate and wasteful responses oftentimes. So those are the five that we addressed, but I, I sort of previewed the argument earlier. The only area that the compacts address are the lack of coordination. So uh, the compacts don't come out of nowhere. They, there's a history, long history, of uh, co cooperating on migration issues. But the most recent initiatives include the Global Migration Group, 2006. That was an interagency working group in, based in Geneva that had 22 UN organizations talking to each other. Uh, we have the Global Forum on Migration and Development, also 2006, which meets regularly. Um, it's an informal space outside of the UN and was created when states wanted to discuss migration. They were sort of the proactive states, but uh, couldn't get everyone on board. So they created a parallel space. 
It's of course been criticized for being too focused on business development and diaspora and not enough on human rights. And the more recent one, uh, Sustainable Development Goals 2015, were collaboratively set by states and replaced the Millennium Development Goals. Now, migration was not a separate goal, but was uh, mentioned in seven of the targets and seven of the official indicators. And those include things like fighting human trafficking, supporting remittances, and reducing brain drain. Let's go straight into the negotiations now. So the negotiations started uh, after the New York Declaration for Refugees and Migrants, which uh, was adopted in September six, uh, 2016 at a summit in New York. Um, much more analysis has been done on the New York Declaration, so I don't want to spend much time on it today. Um, but the document is important because it reaffirms many of the principles and rights that are both um, in previous conventions and in the compacts. The declaration kicks off a two-year process in which um, negotiations happen for the Migration Compact and the Refugee Compact. There are 13 preparatory meetings for the Refugee Compact and 29 consultations for the Migration Compact. I have a schema in which I talk about the negotiation strategies in terms of conservative or amb uh, uh, ambitious. A conservative strategy would be one in which uh, states are seeking fewer rights and fewer institutions in the compact. An ambitious strategy is when they have, uh, they're seeking more rights or more institutions. And a last category are those in which um, some states embrace new institutions, but use those institutions to advocate for restricted migration and to undermine rights. I call that restricted states, restrictionist states. Um, and those actually sought to use international cooperation to institute a norm of stronger border controls, restricted visas, and an absolutist interpretation of uh, sovereignty. So what are the global compacts? Uh, I have three points. Uh, they are first, a non-binding cooperative framework, very much soft law. Second, it's a bundling and reaffirming of rights and third, it's an architecture of global migration governance. So we'll take those one at a time. The, the non-binding cooperative framework, um, this is plainly stated in both of the compacts. The refugee compact says this uh, compact is not, not legally binding. And the, the compact for migration, it says this is a non-legally binding cooperative framework. The documents were consensually negotiated. Most of them ask for voluntary contributions and they don't have any enforcement mechanisms to hold anyone accountable. We also know that um, many states ask for legal opinions from their courts or from their legal departments and uh, like the European Commission reassured states saying that the Global Compact on Migration does not nor does it intend to create any legal obligations under domestic or international law. Also, Denmark, Lithuania, Netherlands, Malta, and the UK highlighted that the, uh, the documents were non-binding um, and not legally binding in their explanatory memorandums um, after they signed. Another uh, reason that they're non-binding is that they are uh, a, a General Assembly resolutions. They were adopted through General Assembly resolutions, which are generally not considered legally binding either. Well, the General Assembly can force, cannot force states to change their policies. It can require the UN system to follow new guidelines and participate in coordination networks and prioritize certain actions. Last, soft law can be considered by courts and is part of customary international law in a way that it's sort of an emerging norm. Okay, the second point also is that the compacts are bundling and reaffirming rights. They bring together disperse ideas and disperse commitments in different uh, treaties and documents um, and put them into two authoritative um, uh, documents. Importantly, the, doc the drafters of the compact did not want to create anything new. Instead, they drew on ideas that have already been committed in other documents. And it is really um, not necessary for states to reaffirm these rights. They already committed to them, but it does show that the states haven't necessarily changed their positions. There are risks, of course, with this, um, because the UN definitely did not think that in 2016, they would be negotiating a migration compact with Donald Trump in power. 
So a second way or reason to bundle and reaffirm rights is that it raised the profile and helped to coordinate disperse initiatives across the UN system. There's, there's a lot of parallel working going on throughout the entire UN system. And third, the compact uses issue linking as part of its negotiation strategy. That means that both states in the global north and global south get something out of these compacts. For example, the compacts reaffirmed the right to border controls, but also reaffirmed the right to seek asylum. This can make the document easier to sell to domestic audiences when the governments highlight parts of their compact that directly serve their interests. Last, and I think this is the most consequential, is that um, the global compacts lay out um, an architecture through which the future of global governance will be built. Now, I know this slide has a lot on it. I'm not going to go through each one of these. But these are all new institutions or forums that were created through the compacts. Each one of these is a space that the states interact and decide how best to govern refugees and migrants. The new forums will be used to coordinate responses, set priorities, share best practices. But I also mean it quite literally, too. These states will be the spaces in which negotiations for future uh, governance take place. One of the biggest changes was that IOM was appointed the coordinator of the UN Network on Migration, um, which will be a central coordination platform uh, for UN activities on migration. This replaces the global migration group that we mentioned before and hopes to have more coordination power. In fact, uh, the network is one of the main ways that the compacts address lack of coordination. And while the UN only joined the UN system in 2016, IOM was quite territorial during the negotiations, pushing hard for this leadership role. One of the ideas that I tease out in the book is that the compacts are the first step along a long process of institutionalizing and crystallizing new norms about migration. General Assembly resolutions are one step, um, a first step to create flexible and broad support, um, getting as many states uh, behind it as possible. And then these forums are also ways in which they institutionalize regular interactions between states. They hope that the process of negotiating the compacts um, and establishing the architecture means that states will be socialized into these new ideas and norms. So now I'll go to the uh, co Global Compact on Refugees. As I mentioned before, it's uh, a non-binding document, but uh, includes principles and frameworks for how states and international organizations should work together uh, in situations with refugees. It includes the Comprehensive Refugee Response Framework, which was actually first introduced in the New York Declaration, and the Program of Action, and follow-up spaces like the Global Refugee Forum, which is held every four years. Actually, the first one was held in 2019. In the book, I, I identify four main contributions, but I don't have time to go through those today. So I'll talk about two of them. Um, and the first is about refugee self-reliance and livelihoods. This is not the first time that UNHCR has introduced this idea, but it is its largest and biggest endorsement of self-reliance. Self-reliance is the idea that refugees sort of can fend for themselves, being economic actors. It includes programs like entrepreneurship training, microfinance loans, subsistence farming, vocational training, and employment matching schemes. And the idea is really to integrate these into local economies. Um, but this, again, is not focused on rights or aid. It's about transforming refugees into economic actors. And that's a big shift away from the 1951 convention. It also justifies cuts in aid and ignores the non-economic components of self-reliance. The second area I'll highlight is uh, resettlement and complementary pathways. The UN Secretary General pushed for a goal to resettle 10% of the world's refugees in the, uh, this goal to be in the compact. But instead, the compact only asked for more efficient uh, resettlement programs and expanded complementary pathways. Now, these complementary pathways are a little vague, but they're supposed to be safe and regulated avenues for refugees that complement resettlement um, by providing some lawful stay in another country where um, protection is given. Now, they're often uh, humanitarian visas, temporary, humanitarian ad admission, uh, community, sp uh, community sponsorship, uh, family reunion, um, and other sort of educational uh, or employment opportunities. Key is that they're supposed to complement, not replace, the durable solutions. 
Again, this is um, an aid response, not a rights-based response. We're seeing that shift there. The main way of achieving global compacts, uh, the things set out in the global compact on refugees, is through voluntary contributions. UNHCR is going to cajole, cajole states um, to voluntarily expand their pathways. And they'll use the Global Refugee Forum uh, to collect and pressure states to do tangible pledges, pledges. But these are all voluntary. Now, what's missing from the compact? Uh, a lot's missing. I have here a lot of things, but I can't go into all of those, of course. I just want to highlight the first one in that the criteria for responsibility sharing. This was an initially in the title for the Global Compact on Responsibility Sharing of Refugees. Right? This was in the title, but states um, uh, did not go for this during the negotiations. They didn't set a criteria or um, any sort of trigger mechanism. It, there's no formula on how or who is going to pay for things. In fact, all of the support platform, platforms that are put um, proposed in the compact must be requested by host states, which means that after every new crisis appears, there'll be squabbling over if the situation is bad enough and who will pay for it. Um, I'd love to talk about any of these other things in um, discussion afterwards. Now I'll go more briefly through the Global Compact on Migration. Um, the Global Compact on Migration set out 23 objectives um, with commitments. Now, I, they use the word commitments, but really they're not legal commitments. These are more signaling their intent, their political intent. And I'll highlight two of the most important. The first is that uh, the compacts affirm what should be non-controversial statement, um, that migrants have human rights. Migrants are not being added to international human rights law, but rather that uh, migrants are protected under uh, human rights law because human rights apply universally to everyone in the first place. The compact though is important. It lays out that states um, that quote, all migrants everywhere are recognized as persons before the law and it requires due process and an independent judicial review. There are also references to the principle on non-discrimination and the principle of non-regression of human rights. But here I highlight a few examples where the compact actually undermines or regresses some of the current standards. For example, it limits the freedom of movement of migrant children by encouraging states to seek alternative detention um, for children, which actually is prohibited in the Convention on the Rights of Children. The compact also explicit, doesn't explicitly guarantee that migrants are detained separately from uh, criminals, which is uh, part of the detention standards in the 1966 International Co Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And finally, the compact doesn't guarantee access to sexual and reproductive health care, which undermines the 1987 UN Committee on Elimination of Discrimination Against Women's general recommendations. All right, now I want to go to the second main contribution of the Global Compact, and that's the idea um, that states have responsibility for safe, orderly, and regular migration. The Global um, Compact for Migration claims that it does not introduce new norms or rights for migrants. Yet the compact does frame several concepts in innovative ways that could be interpreted as early stages of the norm life cycle. So the compact asserts that states are responsible for controlling borders, regulating legal pathways for migration, registering populations, protecting labor rights uh, of migrants, and organizing the detention and labor and, and deportation of migrants, all within the rule of law. Right? This builds on the idea from the, the SDGs and the New York Declaration of well-managed migration policies. Okay? Um, and this norm is emerging. They have lots of details about it in the compact. Um, it's not necessarily a violation of sovereignty. Actually, it's an assertion of sovereignty that states have the right to control their borders, but a responsibility to make it safe and within the law. In some ways, this was a win for the restrictionist states, seeking to use the compact to reaffirm their practices. But it could also be considered a win for human rights activists hoping to subject migration policies to the rule of law. There's also a lot missing from the compacts and I, I'm gonna just uh, leave this up here, love to discuss uh, more of it, but two that I wanna highlight is 
that the detention of migrant children. And here, it, um, the Global Compact really undermines international standards because it allows the detention of my, uh, child migrants as a last resort instead of an outright banning of the child, um, child detention. And second um, uh, thing that's missing from the compact that I want to highlight is the um, principle of non refoulement Now, non refoulement is the idea that no one should be sent back to their country of origin if they're at risk of torture um, or their life, uh, life is in threat. Um, it's supported by multiple human rights treaties. Um, it's reaffirmed in the Refugee Convention. But one of the thing, consequences of the global compact is that states tried to define out that vulnerable migrants were not subject to or were not protected by the, non, the principle of non refoulement And this is a, is a big gaping um, hole in the compact. So in conclusion, um, I want to return to the threads that I ran, that run through the book. Those are that while the uh, compacts are major achievements for uh, global migration governance, their format and contact, content are a result of the three shifts from hard to soft law, from rights to aid, and from the politics of Cold War um, to those of nationalism. Global migration governance has large um, challenges. I mentioned five at the beginning, the lack of capacity, responsibility sharing, access to protection, citizenship and coordination. And the negotiations were really a once in a generation opportunity to address these head on. However, the compacts only address the lack of coordination by creating the UN Network on um, for Migration and a plethora of other institutions for coordination and sharing of best practices. Uh, I view these as um, the first steps in building a more robust and inclusive global migration governance, and the UN made sure to put itself squarely at the center of it. So I'll stop there, and I'm really excited for the discussion and um, happy to take uh, questions and comments after, of course, um, uh, Professor Akram's uh, comments as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nick. And I'd like to turn and invite Professor Akram to give her uh, discussion comments then and start the conversation. Thank you so much, uh, Nick. I really enjoyed reading your manuscript. And as you already know, I took copious notes. I have lots more to share with you. Um, but I thought I would pick up on, I have three main issues that I wanted to raise with you and give you the chance to unpack any one of them. And then uh, I wanted to take up two of the solutions that you proposed and ask you to unpack those a little bit more. Um, but picking up the main points from your basic thesis, which is that the global compacts reflect this shift from hard to soft law, from rights to aid, and from the politics of the Cold War to those of nationalism, um, I really want to focus on the first piece of that. Um, I think that in the... Uh, in, in developing that argument, what seems to be a little bit lost is the critical importance and the hierarchy of treaty obligations um, in the sense that you can't really shift from hard to soft law in any meaningful sense um, because a hard law remains intact un unless and until a treaty is abrogated. So the legal ob obligation on all states remains intact, whether or not the global conversation moves to an emphasis on say soft law or other kinds of negotiated um, uh, sort of accords, if you will. Uh, and that is particularly true when it comes to non Um, That is that although the compacts appear to undermine the obligation of non reformant, they don't abrogate the existing treaty commitments to non reformant. Um, so no state has agreed by entering into the global compacts that they are undermining their uh, requirement to comply with non reformant whether that exists in the treaties, in, the tre in a treaty that they may have become state parties to, that is the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights, uh, 
the refugee convention or any of the regional conventions that underscore and require a commitment to non refoulement And that's particularly important because there is no one scope of non refoulement It depends on the treaty that the state party uh, has committed itself to. So for example, the scope of non refoulement under the Convention Against Torture is different from the scope of it under the ICCPR. So that's sort of one concept I'd love to hear your reactions to. It relates to the second point uh, about the importance of customary international law. Uh, and I think in some ways I, uh, I read a kind of ambiguity in your, um, in your defining norms versus customary international law. And customary international law is, as you mentioned, uh, just as binding as uh, treaty law. Um, and so a norm may be an emerging norm, but until it becomes a binding norm, that is customary international law, it is just that aspirational. Mm. Uh, but that uh, also underscores the point about non refoulement. I think it is pretty universally accepted that non refoulement quite aside from being a treaty obligation is also a customary international law norm. So just simply sort of pulling those together that a state can't, can't be moving to soft law uh, while ignoring its both treaty and customary international law obligations. My third point um, is one that I think picks up on, on a really important point that you make, which is that the real test of the compacts will be in the regional review forum, uh, which are already, which have already begun. Yeah. Uh, and I think there we're going to see perhaps a pushback to at least one of the solutions that you propose, which is that uh, having a global UN mechanism applied across the board, led by UNHCR or IOM as the case may be, is going to run up against regional distinctions in the refugee and migration regimes. Um, at, for example, um, and you note this in, in the manuscript, that Afri both Africa and Latin America have broader and different definitions of refugees, much more expansive. Um, and so the regional review forums will be the test of whether those regional, more protective regional regimes will ultimately win the day or whether we're going to see a retreat from those uh, as well. Um, so let me now uh, just bring those points to two of the solutions that you propose. Uh, solution number one, which is the subcontracting capacity and uh, putting the decision making to UNHCR. And I can see you didn't know her, but my, my dear colleague, Barbara Harrell Bond, will be turning in her grave <laughs> if she read this solution, because as you know, her work was the seminal work pushing back on a regime led by UNHCR, uh, especially her amazing book, uh, Janice Faced Humanitarianism. There is a huge issue about standardizing decisions on refugees on international criteria. And that is going on everywhere in the world with the pushback against UNHCR having internationalized what are probably more generous and more protective uh, regimes that are happening all over the world. And I'll just give you one example because you mentioned that you were there when this was going on. And that is the Greek experience with EASO officers. Initially, when the crisis came to Greece um, and um, the rest of Europe was desperate to make sure that the refugees arriving in Greece didn't go to farther parts of Europe, mm -hmm. Greece had a very, very high grant rate for asylum seekers. Yeah. And then the EASO officers arrived, and suddenly the Greek uh, grant rate dropped dramatically. Uh, we were doing a project there at the time and met with um, in the international and domestic organizations, including Greek 
immigration and refugee judges who were absolutely horrified uh, about the uh, consequences of the EU EASO officers coming to adjudicate their uh, asylum claims. Um, so I guess I want to know how that becomes a solution that advances what we see as really terrible consequences. And obviously that's only one, I have other illustrations, but that's only one illustration uh, to kind of pick on, but I think you know that, that uh, environment. And the last point is the marketplace proposal that I know Peter Schuck has been advancing for some time. Um, and I guess I would say this is already happening. And I think we are seeing that this is disastrous. Um, and that it is simply entrenching the existing um, uh, containment paradigm with wealthy countries throwing money to already excessively over overburdened and saturated states. And that's, yeah. of course, right now, Lebanon and Jordan. But um, even in situations where countries were incredibly generous, like Pakistan and Iran with the Afghan situation. And again, there, what's so interesting is they aren't even parties, neither of those countries is party to the Refugee Convention. And yeah. yet the enormous generosity that they have shown towards this protracted refugee situation. Um, so I'll stop there. That's a lot of points. You can pick up on anything you like. Thank you so much, Nick. Thank you. Uh, thank you really so much. This is um, an honor to have you comment on it because you are such a pillar of the field and to have your insight is, is really um, is great. I am, I'm going to touch on a few of the things. I um, I am genuinely wrestling a little bit with the hard to soft law question um, that you've posed because um, it isn't that they're um, abrogating or throwing out all of their hard law, but um, there is a strategic decision to use soft law to undermine hard things, even if they're still committed, right? So um, there, there are several ways in which that happens. One would be, um, uh, yes, you, you're still, give, you're still um, governed by the hard law commitments, but if there are no enforcement mechanisms, just deciding to not abide by it anymore is your only way of changing the, the, the treaty, right? So if you decide you're not going to be part of this uh, treaty anymore, just changing your behavior, the state's behavior, is a way of changing hard law. Soft law, proposing this is a, I don't know, it might be a more polite way of changing hard law because you're actually putting it on paper. You're, you're saying what you're actually doing rather than just changing, right? I mean, you can just see in the Trump's, uh, Trump administrator's behavior right now, he's not renegotiating the refugee convention, he's just changing behavior. So is he still bound by it? Yes, but, um, but uh, it, it does not mean, um, but, but what I think is innovative here is that they're using the soft law to actually help renegotiate some of these things. Um, so I think that um, I would like to try to apply to your, your, your question about um, non refoulement This also, I um, completely agree with your understanding of it being customary international law. It's not just based in treaty. It has the different scopes on uh, different treaties and different cases. Um, uh, even still, we can see states in their uh, debates, in the negotiation, uh, we he hear it in their consultation, um, statements. We see it at the end after they have signed the, the um, compact saying, just by the way, non-refoulement does not apply to migrants. I think China was the one who explicitly said this. Now that is, I mean, that's not what the hard law says. That's not what customary law says, but they're asserting this in this space, right? So if I go back to the idea that this is the architecture of global migration governance now, these are the spaces where negotiations are happening, Literally, you have a state trying to use that space in a restrictionist way to negotiate down the standard, right? Using the space to air out their interpretation of it. And actually, when, if you read the book, there are a few very interesting statements by Russia who keeps saying like uh, very f funny phrases about like, by the way, climate change migration doesn't exist. And everyone in the room kind of looks at them and says, 
we weren't talking about climate change migration. How did you, but they clearly have an agenda of trying to renegotiate a standard that they feel is being pushed on something else, but using that space to undermine it, to um, this uh, softification, right? To, to undermine the law. Um, but I, I agree with you, it's not, uh, they're still technically bound by the hard law, right? Um, let me think a little bit uh, with you about the regional differentiations. In one version of the story, you could say that the regional variation are success stories, and we would hope to upload regional definitions to the international, right, to the global, that we have an African definition or a Latin American definition or an EU definition that are expanded, and we see its success, we see it's actually providing more protection, let's use that as a best practice to upload it to the, the global. Um, the test will be if it does, right? If it does, or if it is a race to the bottom. And I would say evidence points to the opposite. I mean, look at the way UNHCR is um, ignoring uh, many uh, human rights violations around the world, but in my cases, uh, in Greece, in Italy, in, um, in the Mediterranean, in ways that you just think, okay, they're, they're not using that, in, that regional definition to make it higher, they're actually lowering to others. Right? Um, okay, I, uh, it was a very much a, an interesting shift for me to change from, um, in most of the book, talking about the analysis, the detailed legal um, uh, commitments that are being developed, to thinking about, okay, what is the future of global migration and governance, and how can we actually change these things? Um, and uh, I didn't get to present many of them today. I uh, Hopefully you can read them in the book. But some of my proposals align with the challenges of um, global migration. So if you have lack of capacity, well, one way to fill your lack of capacity is by subcontracting capacity to UNHCR. And I fully agree with your criticism of UNHCR not um, raising a standard. Um, I think EASO... Um, I don't know if I agree a bit with the EASO example. In Greece, we saw um, EASO and Frontex be deployed to the hotspots. And at a certain point, that meant instead of Greek asylum officers making decisions, they were being advised, or um, at some point, uh, people were saying, all they're doing is doing the inputting into the computer, not making decisions. But that being said, I, I think they were making a lot of decisions. Um, but the high rate to, to low rate, um, it reveals only a little bit in that there was a bottleneck to get into the system to begin with. It, all about the access to protection question, right? So if you look at the numbers of, of decisions that were being granted during this time period, they may have been a higher rate, but there were minuscule percentages of the people who were actually applying. I mean, people were getting a number, waiting in line, they had to do a Skype call to be able to apply in Greece, mm -hmm. and their date to call was two and a half years from then, right? So it's not protection if you're sitting in a refugee camp somewhere waiting for your phone number, right? Like it's just really, really waiting in line uh, for that. So I think that um, ESO didn't improve the efficiency rate of that either. We'll be clear too. Um, I'm not as skeptical of, um, of international institutions though for lowering it. I think there is potential here. I guess... I have dreams of UNHCR being able to make decisions for uh, asylum in other countries in ways that they, um, I think in countries in Africa, the sovereignty question isn't such a big deal. But in Europe, it is a huge deal. Well, let's look at this, um, this uh, contradiction and point it out and say, well, if you trust them to make the decision in Kenya, then you should trust it to be made in the US or Canada. Um, Okay, the last question about marketplace proposal. I think, um, so, so the, the proposal is that if we're going to, um, well, the proposal talks about commodification and a marketplace of quotas. And if you are going to um, uh, have a certain number of refugees that need to be resettled around the world, you can set a standard quota based on your GDP, your population size, and a few other variables. And that equation could be your quota. Actually, the EU had this proposed right in 2016. Um, the, uh, the marketplace comes in when a state doesn't want to uh, actually take the quota and they could either trade or sell or hand off the, the, the quota. Now, um, 
of course, there are huge questions about human rights and what kind of trading there is uh, going on in your commitments. But I think um, you're also right in saying that it's already happening. States have already decided that we will pay off Pakistan to host these people and not resettle them. We will pay off Kenya to host Somalis to, and not resettle them, right? And that's a form of commodification. In fact, I am writing a piece right now that looks at how UNHCR has actually helped sell this type of commodification to the global audience, saying a better way to promote this is to um, sign a tripartite agreement. It makes you look like a really good actor, even though you haven't signed the refugee convention, it makes you look like a really good actor and you'll be able to fundraise a lot. Well, this is another version of commodification, right? You're just, you're not um, holding rights accountable, you're pushing it towards aid. Um, another whole literature is talking about this in terms of um, refugee rentierism, right? That the state is like a rentier state, but it's not oil that is your resource, it's refugees that are your resource. Now, that feels like a, it's a stretch, but it does also point to the power dynamics and the, where the funding is going in the system. I'll leave it there because I'm really excited for questions. Um, thank you so much for this. I'm going to really take all of these on board and have a lot to work on. I'll turn it back to Kaya and our question moderators. Fantastic. Thank you, Professor Akram. Um, actually, it looks like the first uh, person who uh, registered a question was Professor Lori. Um, so, Nura, would you like to uh, take over? Hi, everyone. Nura Lori, Assistant Professor of International Relations at um, RD, and I co-direct the Forced Migration um, Initiative and Human Trafficking Initiative with Kaya. Um, Nick, thank you for this uh, talk. I, I have two questions. Um, one is having read the book, I think that there's a lot of richness in the field work um, that, that it would be nice to kind of bring out. Um, and on that, no, I have two questions. One is more of a just taking a step back on Europe and border control. And the other kind of gets at the debate that you were just having about soft law and hard law. Um, on the, the kind of overview, you have this narrative of migrant crisis that emerges in 2014, all the way up until 2016, but we see that irregular sea arrivals, for example, drop immediately. Um, and so uh, you've, you've given us a bit about some of the techniques that the EU used. Um, can, can you sort of link those to decreasing? Uh, is this working from the EU's perspective? Are they actually, um, are these compacts an effective way of controlling the border and, and, and decreasing flows? Um, and, and, and with that question, not does it work for migrants, because I think we know that it really doesn't in many ways, but is, is it serving the kind of executive discretionary power of the EU that it's trying to maintain here? Um, and then relatedly, you mentioned all of this architecture, the global uh, mig migration kind of framework outside of um, uh, the UN or uh, national domestic legal processes. And I'm wondering how those spaces shape the kind of balance of power between the executive branch and the judiciary and specifically judicial overview. Um, and so I think that this kind of comes back to this question of hard law versus soft law, because we know that for example, migrant interdiction uh, extraterritorial migrant interdiction is designed to evade the courts. Um, are some of these global frameworks are outside of this uh, established um, kind of space, does that do the same? Does it allow for more discretionary executive power? Really interesting, really interesting question. Um, I uh, would have to go through all of the forms to think about if each one of those does do that with the executive. I just want to highlight one straight away is complementary pathways are often discretionary. It's like um, uh, the presidential's power to be able to admit um, uh, 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 asylees, right? Um, they can let in individuals or they can let in all Hungary, uh, all Hungary, right? Like it's a, a discretionary power at one point. Um, and so in some ways, complementary pathways could be a very much a discretionary power. Um, if you look at the US's resettlement numbers are always based by the president setting that and uh, consultation with Congress. Um, there's not much judiciary over, uh, judicial overview on that. Um, I, 
would say that um, most of these spaces uh, of global governance are about sharing best practices, which in some ways are more about, um, uh, about learning states that aren't very new, are new migration states, don't have deportation processes, don't have um, standards for separating migrants in, um, from uh, criminals. And so there, there is a lot to be learned there in just practices. In terms of um, overview, it's not like the decision is going to become it will be coming down the, the road from uh, the UN to the police in a certain uh, country. This is very much about um, capacity building across ways, right? So it's like um, Malta will send uh, a, a team to Libya to train Coast Guard, right? And that is literally probably within one of these forums, you could think of that as capacity building. Now, is it helping migrants' rights? Genuinely, we don't know. We know that the, 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 the border guards, uh, Libyan border guards, are taking people back to detention centers that are in despicable conditions. Some call them slave-like conditions, right? Um, but it is still capacity building and it's learning to control migration. And uh, you see the UN also becoming entangled in these very gray zones, right? This is also brought up a lot with IOM joining the UN system. Right? IOM being one of these organizations that was outside the UN for so long, moved into the UN system in 2016. And the questions about how it was able to be committed to its human rights um, were still hotly debated, hotly debated. So um, that's an open question. Sorry, I wanted to go to your first one. Um, um, I mean, it, it's okay. We can we can talk about that. Um, I, I know you actually are starting to have a whole range of questions. Uh, my point was, are the numbers going down for Europe? Numbers are very clearly going down. The question, though, is um, why was it a priority for the UN when it finally hit Europe, right? It, migration crisis numbers have been off the charts for years, and it's been growing, but it was only when it came to Europe that it became a priority for the UN. I think that is part of the explanation about geopolitics shifting, about um, when the crisis came home to Europe, it became a priority for their dip diplomatic missions, right? And that's when they really started saying, we need a New York declaration and we need um, the two compacts. And many of the European states, which have some expanded definitions of protection, were some of the ones pushing most for restrictionist policies. Let's use these compacts in order to help get approval for restricting border controls. Yeah. Thank you so much. Nick, the next question you have is from Professor Caruso. Hi, Nick, um, and thank you so much for this. And thanks, uh, Susan. I, I loved the exchange on uh, hard and soft law, and I'd like to push a little bit more on, on, that, uh, on that distinction. So uh, one first question is uh, what uh, what room uh, does it uh, what room do you have in your book uh, for the kind of soft law that is not a UN global contact? In other words, there are samples of soft law which are intentionally left not as treaties but as bilateral memoranda of understanding uh, that are doing a lot of what the UN global compact is doing at a global scale, but on a minor, uh, on a regionally confined uh, level. So, for instance, the EU-Turkey agreement of 2016, um, or the many arrangements that Italy had with Libya and Italy had to shift from having it in treaty form to having it in memoranda form, etc. Et so uh, I was wondering whether in your reflection as to the shift from hard to soft law, those things uh, occupy a meaningful space either as step stones to the UN Global Compact compacts, or as something different as ad hoc solutions. I don't know if you had considered that. Now, uh, as regards to the, the, again, the distinction between hard and soft law, I have a more general question. Um, one of the things that uh, Dean Najam wanted us to do when I was appointed director of this center was to really bring the legal perspective onto questions of global governance more directly. So I'm going to ask that kind of question. Whenever we shift from um, 
hard law to soft law, questions arise. And so you make it as an argument. The argument is there has been a shift. You are documenting a shift. Now, I'm not sure that's an argument. This seems to me a fact, which begs the question, how do we turn it into an argument. And the argument usually goes uh, in the following way. Think about labor rights, okay? So we have certain rights for workers, and then we have the soft law in a completely different setting, which is the employee handbook. The employee handbook is the typical form of soft law that is not binding. So the question or the possibility for argument is, what does soft law do to hard law? Now, Susan has the position, it does nothing, it doesn't touch it. Maybe it doesn't enhance it, but certainly it cannot possibly erode it. And so Susan represents the lawyer who's instinctively very suspicious of these kinds of mush, mushy area of the law where nobody can say these are the rights of the people, right? On the other hand, you have people who say, if we try to make our hard law better, we would go nowhere. The world will stay a cold place. The employment environment will stay a cold place. And so perhaps a soft law is the best thing that we can achieve in the circumstances, whatever hard law uh, remains dissatisfying. So it's a way to improve it. So I wonder what your argument would be if faced with this choice, given the fact of the switch from hard law to soft law. Is that a good thing, a bad thing in between? Does it enhance the quality of migration management in a way that you find desirable? Or does it dilute, detract, take away along Susan's reflection? What's your argument? How do you judge the shift? Thank you very much. That's great. Um, I absolutely think soft law is impacting hard law, not in that it uh, gets rid of the uh, hard law requirements, but that it changes how states perceive their interpretations and, and what they are required by it, meaning that they will start to behave differently when they have permission in soft law forums to do other things. So the first example I would say is sexual and reproductive health. We know that in the first two drafts of the Global Compact for Migration, it said that all migrants um, were going to have access to sexual health, uh, reproductive health during it. And who uh, opposed it? Pakistan and the Vatican. And they removed it from that. So um, what do I see? We had uh, a higher standard before. And, um, and then during these spaces, they're giving themselves permission to start to move away from a hard law commitment that they had. Right? Maybe they were, already, uh, they were already behaving that way, but they're trying to promote that in this space, right? And they won, it's not in there now, right? Um, does it enhance its quality? I don't think it's a win or lose answer here. I think it has more to do with, there are spaces in which we have real wins and we have spaces in which there are real losses, right? Um, there in this soft law document, at least the compact and, and the things that will come out of all of the forums, there will be real wins. I really think that LGBT rights was a loss in a lot of these spaces. It's not mentioned at all. It's sort of ignored and, and, and totally um, uh, disregarded, except for a few comments by states during their memorandums. Um, but I think in the future, soft law will develop over these spaces and UNHCR already has several handbooks talking about this that will develop and get better and better. I'm optimistic about that. I'm not necessarily pessimistic. I was kind of just disappointed that the first step wasn't there, right? Um, but on the same respect, the same type of handbooks are being shared from border guards across the way. We know in Europe, this is happening. Obviously Frontex does it a lot, but they're giving each other permission to use um, force in different ways with migrants um, and sharing. Now, is that undermining the hard law? I think it does hurt the, the rights in the end, right? So it's happening on both sides. And because the global migration governance is such a huge tent, it can do both, right? It's not gonna be just one or the other. Thank you. All right, Nick, thank you. Um... The next question you have is from... Yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot for this presentation. Uh, it's, it's quite comprehensive and um, gives a very large overview. Uh, and I look forward to reading the book. I heard that there are more details in the book and more concrete examples. So um, I'm a postdoctoral fellow myself. I'm an anthropologist who works on citizenship and uh, basically uh, former 
uh, labor migrant workers and Palestinian refugees in, in Germany. So I have a very kind of like nation state perspective on this. Um, so there are several things I wanted to ask you. I mean, I'm going to reduce it to two questions and a request, basically. So one question is, could you tell us, could you step back a bit and tell us about why the need, the necessity to define these compacts when there are already laws in place? Um, like on what rationale are these compacts also defined? I mean, you mentioned, for example, refugee self-reliance, which reminds me of certain debates that were going on during the refugee crisis in Europe about like, refugees taking up resources when they in fact bring gold and money with them and hide them. So is it basically, is this trying to accommodate nation state uh, interests or majoritarian nationalisms in, in Western states, in the EU, in the US, what have you? I mean, I'm just interested in like, how come there, there is this move as such? The second question is, um, what is the category of the migrant? I think that's a really interesting category you did not fully um, deconstruct because I thought migration is something that is kind of a mobility question that subjects with passports do when they leave one state to the other. But it seems that there is something more specific here. So I was wondering um, who is subject to these migrant migration compacts? Uh, isn't migration regulated between states and the subject that is traveling? So what, who is the subject basically? And then could you give us concrete examples? I'm sure, I mean, you have seen this materialized when you were giving answers earlier, you had a lot to say about how this looks in concrete action. And I think it's very interesting. I think you're onto something by saying that this changes behavior because I think it changes certainly state practices. So um, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, so why the need to have the complex already? Well. I, I will say it directly comes out of the refugee crisis in Europe. States said we want ways to cooperate more, and this is what we should. And we don't quite know how to do it yet. And they came to the UN with those um, those desires. I mean, it's building on previous things, but then it became a big house in which expanded the the remit of it. I think many of the restriction states would have loved to keep it on the bilateral agreements, going back to the past question. I think they would have loved to keep it on bilateral agreements that just go back and forth between states. Those um, are included in the global compact. They're encouraged. They say you should do that. You should both sign remittance agreements and have more bilateral agreements. Um, but the, the need was that states wanted to have some sort of framework in order to cooperate, in which they developed this plethora of, um, of forums that they're going to be cooperating and going to. One of um, James Hathaway had a, a commentary on the compacts and he said, the, um, the main outcome of the compacts is going to be that there are lots more meetings. I mean, literally that's what it is, is there are going to be lots more meetings in which people discuss how to solve these problems. It's not the answer in and of itself, it is creating spaces to discuss even more. And in some ways, they'd kick the can just down the road. They didn't decide on a funding format. They didn't decide on which um, uh, refugees should be prioritized. They didn't decide on um, an automatic uh, mechanism that would trigger a support platform. None of that happens. It's all that we will have the option to, and then we'll have the discussion of what it will be at that point, which is, um, it's something. It's not what human rights advocates and a lot of people in the UN wanted, but it is something. Um, and the subject, the carrier, the migrant. Um, I don't have a dogmatic definition of migrant. I, I use the general idea of migrant. I define refugees the way the, the, the Refugee Convention does. Um, I think it, if you ask states, they're very clear that the Refugee Convention, sorry, the Refugee Compact is applying only to 1951 uh, and 1967 refugees, right? That's what they want it to be, nothing more. The Global Compact for Migration, they want it to be for legal migrants, right? There's a lot of conversation and discussion in the debate about this development, about a definition of irregular and regular migrants, because they were worried that some of the rights that were um, committed in the uh, Migration Compact were going to be given to irregular migrants when they didn't deserve it. Right? That's what the states were saying, is that they were not signing up for things for irregular migrants. 
in the end, no definition was given for it. Um, and so the question is, uh, how, how do we know who it applies to? Is it only regular migrants or irregular migrants? Um, and several, uh, not several, many of the restrictionist states in their explanatory notes when they're signing the, um, the compact say, this only applies to regular migrants. Do not think this is expanding to irregular migrants. Nick, I don't see any additional questions, so I'm going to ask you one. So I, I, I like the project. I like what it's doing. It fills a big gap, you know, here in understanding um, process, understanding uh, institutional history, understanding then, you know, bottom-up impact. I want to push you a little bit harder on the political science end. Um, and I'm not just trying to put on a political scientist hat and, you know, and, and do that, but I'm genuinely curious um, about the kinds of things that maybe don't fit in this book project, but might fit into an article that's a little bit more political science-y, you know, about this. And specifically, I'm thinking about the literature on why international institutions happen. Um, and so in international relations, there's like a literature that's very game theoretical, actually, and very um, functional saying, under these conditions, this is what makes international institutional formation more likely, and whether it's more formal or informal and things like that, you know, like where things like th theories out there, like when information is low and shared information is low, the formation is more likely to happen of an international institution. And we don't, and it can mean something formal like the UN, or it can mean something a little less formal you know, like a compact, you know, according to political science theories of what formal and informal mean. And so I'm just wondering, I'm not trying to push you. This is not like a job talk where I'm saying, you know, show me how this happens in a political science way. But I ask you to explore that a little bit about what, how you would theorize if you haven't yet kind of in what direction you would theorize, because it's interesting. Yeah. Um, so the political science literature approaches the migration regime as sort of the missing regime, trying to say, why isn't there one? Um, and the reason is asymmetrical, asymmetrical relation, power relations between the global north and the global south and divergent interests, right? The global north doesn't want this and they, um, they have the power to decide that they're not going to do it. And that's why the institutions don't become mandatory. You don't have mandatory quotas. You don't have mandatory funding because of those. All of that exists. Um, the reason that the global compact, I think, made its way through this landmine to actually get signed is that there was real issue linking and they created it um, in the broadest broadest umbrella possible, right? So um, I guess I have to talk about these two separately. The Refugee Convention is the most narrow possible. It's only about pledging and giving a few uh, more commitments on certain things and a framework. And the migration compact is as broad and as, um, I don't want to say, um, it's not diluted, but it's just as broad as possible with as many issues linked together as possible. So any state can find something they want out of that and can go home and sell that, right? And the negotiators, the drafters, the um, people really committed to this process definitely said to the, um, the other states, like, we know you're worried about this le being legally binding. You could sign this and do nothing and you would be fine. So why, what's your problem, right? And so the, the way that they sold it to states was, you will find something in here that will actually be very useful for you, right? Um, you may not like the other parts of it, but you will find something in there that is very useful for you. Um, so that is why I think the Global Compacts fits at least this, uh, this literature. It also tries to take it from high politics, um, uh, heads of state and the UN, and tries to make it a technical problem. All of these forums become technical spaces in which policy advisors do studies and try to add more data, and that's gonna be what solves the problem. I'm skeptical that you can, you can find a technical solution to these political problems, but these are very much technical spaces in the end. From a political science theory point of view, or international theory, international relations point of view, what you're saying is that the um, the agents in international organizations found innovations uh, to bypass some of these fundamental truths about how regimes get formed or not. Absolutely, and issue linking is a major major one in that, right? Definitely. 
definitely. And I would say UNHCR has been held up in many places as a norm entrepreneur. Um, there are probably stories and articles to be written about how the New York Declaration and the uh, Comprehensive Refugee Response Framework became one of these things that UNHCR was using as a norm entrepreneur. Um, there's another story to be written about how IOM consolidated a lot of its power into the network, right? The network is now this hub and it's trying to use that as the main thing. In fact, IOM, the International Organization for Migration, rebranded itself on Twitter. I don't know if you saw this. It is now calling itself the UN Migration Agency, which is not its technical name, but it is going by that just so everyone thinks they're the main, <laughs> the migration agency. Fascinating. Yeah, I th I'd like you to write that article too. So put it on the list. <laughs> All right. Mm -hmm. So we have actually a follow-up back, um, a follow-up question and comment from Professor Akram to, to end the, the seminar. Um, thank you uh, for the thoughtful uh, comments and questions. Um, and I wonder, Nick, if perhaps the expectations were too high from the global compact process. If one thinks about uh, how negotiations work, multi-party negotiations work, the more parties at the table, the lower the outcome of negotiations. Uh, because it is going to be the bottom line where there will be agreement amongst uh, such a plethora of, of players. Uh, and of course, with certain uh, powerful parties dominating, I mean, the example of the United States basically coming in and forcing out an agreement on no detention of uh, migrant children uh, getting that into the global compact and then basically walking away from the process is such an insight into how this works. So I wanted to come back to uh, an earlier point that I made, which is I think that the outcome uh, really does remain to be in the regional forums mm. and that the task for all of us in civil society who care about a uh, greater protection for both migrants and refugees is to get our acts together and work within the global, the, the regional forums and bring the more protective regimes in each regional forum to the fore. Mm. And that that is our task going forward. Um, and perhaps that's something that shouldn't be forgotten in the sense that we were hoping too much out of a process that was never going to be able to deliver other than a very low bottom line. Absolutely. That is, um, uh, th this is a really good um, uh, point to make because if you look at the EU-wide um, quotas, right, they had a refugee quota system in which they were going to redistribute uh, migrants from Greece and Italy across all over, fell apart, mostly because Eastern European states said, we, don't, we, we won't do it. Um, but when they lowered the number of states involved, something like a pack of six or seven states, they agreed to it and were able to do it. And they're now resettling people from Malta and Italy. This is like exactly that example. You lower the number of states and you're able to get a higher agreement. Um, I, I completely agree with your advocacy uh, uh, in terms of thinking about regional uh, institutions as, um, as spaces. And I think this will be, this is the lasting legacy of the compacts that we have these spaces to, to regular spaces to meet, right? Because the UN was not going to have a regular space until after this, right? And now we have a, an on-ramp to have these discussions and pressure and to present findings and get data. And it's, it will be the spaces. Um, what happens next is, um, what, what we and the states make of it. Thank you very much. Nick, I just wanted to say thank you for such a fascinating talk and, uh, and an important book. Also, thank you to my co-hosts, Professor Lori and Professor Caruso. And thanks to Professor Akram for her fantastic comments and for uh, giving you such a service you know, in, in all of her comments, written and oral. And thank you to everyone who participated. I actually really like these Zoom webinars. I think they're wonderful. Uh, I think that they uh, create a conversation that wouldn't be happening otherwise. So thank you, Nick.